Let us now hear from a panel of speakers whose research has impacted and can be felt across the globe. Population Aging, Agenda 2030, Our Common Agenda by Ms. Amal Abu Rafay, Chief of Program on Aging at the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, Decade of Healthy Aging Opportunities for NGO Community by Dr. Jane Barat, Secretary General of International Federation on Aging, IFA, Work Advocacy of NGO Committee on Aging New York by Dr. Cynthia Stewin, Chair, NGO Committee on Aging New York and UN Main Representative, International Federation on Aging. Please welcome Ms. Amal Abu Rafay, Dr. Jane Barat, and Dr. Cynthia Stewin. Thank you so much, Sneha. Thank you, everyone, for the kind invitation. It's a treat to join you today, and good morning from New York City. If there is one thing that we all have in common around the world, it's that we are all aging. There are three ways to describe global aging. First, it's unprecedented. Without parallel in human history, the number of persons aged 60 years and over is projected to accelerate in the coming decades. The second is that it is pervasive. The growth in number um, of older persons is a global phenomenon. So while countries are at very different stages of the process, nevertheless, virtually every country will experience a substantial increase in the size of its older population between today and 2050. And the third is that global population aging is enduring. So globally, the number of older persons is growing faster than the numbers of people of any other age group. And in eight years, by 2030, older people will globally outnumber youth. And this increase will be the greatest and the most rapid in low and middle income countries. So by 2050, the number of older persons is projected to more than double, where one in six people around the world will be older persons. In India, our projections, will, which will be updated later this year, show that the number of older people will also double by 2050. And today, older Indians make up 10% of the population. But in our work, we steer away from percentages. We talk about total numbers because each number is a human being. And that small, what looks at, at first glance as a small 10% actually amounts to almost 150 million older persons in India. So what's the takeaway message? All societies in the world are in the midst of this longevity revolution. Some are at its early stages and some are more advanced, but all will pass through this extraordinary transition. However, we see here um, in, in New York at the UN that many countries, specifically in Asia, in Africa, they remain blinded by all things youth. Although these regions are expected to witness the largest relevant increase in the number of older persons, some by 230% by 2050. So how does this global population aging affect development? In our view, it involves two main challenges. Not that global aging is a challenge, but rather the need to challenge two status quo. The first challenge is the inadequate acknowledgement of diversity of older persons. I ask you to imagine an older person in your mind, and I bet you that each one of us will have a different vision of who that older person is. Harnessing population aging for social and economic progress requires that assumptions and stereotypes regarding old age be challenged. Central to this acknowledgement is that diversity is a defining characteristic of old age and the consequent reflection of this heterogeneity in public policies. We observe heterogeneity among older persons in their needs, their capacities, their preferences, their living arrangements, as well as their health and economic status. What does this mean to policies? It means that a successful response to population aging and longevity needs to be a multifaceted one. The second challenge is the lack of incorporation of a life course approach. 
Policies on aging deserve close examination from the developmental perspective of a broader life course and a society-wide view. For example, it's important to recognize the situations in which inequalities widen across the life course. Disadvantages experienced by different social groups, such as women, persons with disabilities, migrants, ethnic minorities, are often amplified at older ages. I have a few points to make on Agenda 2030, and Sneha mentioned the Global Development Goals. Each year, member states in New York voluntarily report their implementation of those goals, a select number each year. These reports are a tool for accountability. They help strengthen national ownership of the Sustainable Development Goals, promote inclusiveness and participation, as well as more effective implementation of the 2030 Development Agenda. Our team analyzed all the reports submitted so far, 248 reports from 216, uh, 2016 to 2021. And we saw that over two thirds of member states included reference to aging. However, when you take a closer look in these reports, older persons were predominantly addressed as a vulnerable group. They often were portrayed, portrayed aging related issues as a challenge, including by focusing on concerns over the sustainability of social services, pensions, and healthcare systems, and as a factor that limits long-term economic and income growth. So last year, the Secretary General launched his vision of the world in, as he sees it in the next five years in a report called Our Common Agenda. And if you take a look at that report, you'll see that it's heavily skewed towards a more youthful perspective of what this new social contract will be and how the priorities um, focus around uh, age groups. And some member states in New York have already flagged this concern to the United Nations Secretary General, that older persons have to be part and parcel of this exercise. There are two upcoming exercises that will take place at the United Nations that we call upon all advocates to engage in. The first is that the United Nations will be preparing a roadmap, a system-wide plan that is people-centered and that will take into account diversity, age, and gender. And this is a great opportunity to incorporate older persons, their preferences, and their needs. Mm -hmm. And the second is that the UN and member states are looking into the possibility of holding a World Social Summit in 2025. And that will also be another opportunity to raise awareness and incorporate aging related issues and issues of importance to older persons. Um, and finally, there is one element that is currently underway in New York, which is the discussion by governments of whether or not there is a need for an international legal instrument. Such a legal instrument would set international standards around the world for governments to look up to and to seek as a baseline for the services and policies and legislation that they offer older persons. And we ask everyone to also engage actively um, in those. I will not touch upon the decade because my colleague Jane Barrett will go over that in more detail. Thank you for your attention. Good morning. Um, my name is Jane Barrett and I'm calling in from Toronto, Canada, and it's a great pleasure to be with you today. Um, congratulations to the organisers and all those that come together today for this first Ilaga International Conference. My brief today is to talk with you a little bit about the UN Decade of Healthy Ageing and how civil societies, people like you and me and organisations that we represent, can actually work to drive the agenda of the decade of healthy aging. So first and foremost, we've, and it, it really comes on the back of uh, my, um, my friend and colleague Amal's presentation. You know, older people are not a homogeneous group. We're all so very different. And across your great nation, you know, the importance of social determinants of health underpinning the health and well-being and quality of life of older people must always be at the forefront of effective policy making and practice. 
And so as we think about positive, active um, ageing, we almost put that lens of inequities and the social determinants through everything that we talk about and live. Next, please. Can we move the, the slides forward? Thank you. Um, at the heart of, you know, the UN decade of healthy ageing is what is healthy ageing really? And I like to really, you know, revisit this definition time and time again, because it tells us something quite different about the previous definition that talked to us about the absence of disease. You know, healthy ageing is a process. It's a process of developing and maintaining the functional ability that enables well-being into older age. And it's this process across the life course, but it's our own ability to maintain and improve our function within the environment in which we live. Next, please. Thank you. You know, all of our work and all of your thinking around the decade is really framed across history. And we go back, right back, and probably before to 1982, the UN Vienna International Plan of Ageing. And I know in your region, you know, there has been consultations around the Madrid International Plan of Action. And as part of that consultation, we're really revisiting the progress that not only governments have made, but also civil society. And so, you know, we don't come into the decade without lots of information. We actually come in with a number of different plans, agendas to hook our carriage on to drive change. Next, please. It's also important to share with you some pivotal agendas and plans that the IFA actually acknowledges in all of our work. And one of them is, as I said, the Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging, you know, and the three priority areas. And that really is aligned with the principles and actions and agendas of the United Nations Decade of Healthy Aging. Now, where, do, where has this come from? You know, back in 2015, the WHO delivered the first evidence-based report on ageing and health. And of course, we also, you know, pull through this, you know, the general work program of the WHO, where there's three priority areas. We also, at the IFA, put in context, you know, oncoming reports such as you know, the global report on ageism and the immunisation agenda 2030. And I do want to acknowledge as we sit here, some of us in our homes and some of us face to face, you know, the brutal nature of the pandemic that we have all lived in, but those that have not been able to survive the pandemic and some of those that will be living with certainly functional impairments. Um, it's sometimes, you know, odd, isn't it? You know, when we're almost through some series of global unprecedented change, we almost think that it's gone, but it's very much present with us. And I know that the, uh, the cases in India have dramatically reduced, but we live with it and understanding how to shape our healthy agenda within that. Next, please. I want to touch on, you know, what it is, you know, the, the relationship between a person and their environment. You know, in the decade, we are talking about how do we create an environment that enables an older person to do what they have reason to value. And Damal talked about dignity and respect and protecting the rights of older people. You know, some of the other environmental impacts will be the complexity of our healthcare systems, the physical environment, the community resources, and of course, ageism is part of, you know, the political and social frame of reference that we need to really combat to break through and ensure that the environment for people of all ages, but particularly those, you know, in the older age group have reason to value. And that then touches on, you know, economic and social protection you know, as well as access to health systems, but also this whole area of digital literacy that is very confronting 
to those that don't have access to the internet. Next, please. I want to touch on also the, the fact that we do talk about a life course approach to aging, but that's emblematic of the life course approach to health. And across, you know, our, our life, you know, there'll be various instances that impact the health and well-being of our person, but those that we live with. And in that environment, you know, we also need to touch on the familial caring roles that each of us may have you know, and the communities in which we live, because it's the communities that actually help us ensure that this, in, this environment is accessible to all. Next, please. But in the latter part of our life, we also take into consideration that there are generally three different trajectories of an older person's life. And they all relate to function, don't they? We have those people that will have a high stable capacity and that will gradually diminish. But overall, you know, they will be in that phase of dying peacefully and with dignity. And then we have that other group of older people that have a declining capacity. And then the third trajectory is where there's a significant and dramatic loss of capacity. Now in every trajectory, and these are not exclusive, they overlap. In every single trajectory, we have a responsibility to look at the environment and look at the opportunities where we can act, break down the barriers whether it's being in our social system, our economic system, our health system, but also the community, the community, and as we've already heard, the intergenerational community. Next, please. So the UN Decade of Healthy Aging was launched in September 2021. I almost forgot what year it was, 2021. And it was a very proud and auspicious moment because it was through the diligent, systematic and comprehensive consultation and discussions between the World Health Organization and the United Nations that we now have the UN Decade of Healthy Aging. And why do we need this? We need it because it is a point in time across the next 10 years and beyond where we have global collaboration across sectors and across disciplines and that's where civil society has a unique and powerful role to play, to be a voice, to inform, to collaborate, to reach across the aisles. We have a responsibility to reach across the aisles, to academia, to government, to industry, to understand a common agenda. Next, please. And in the decade of healthy aging, there are four main action areas integrated care, primary integrated care. You know, how do we actually ensure the simplified pathways through our primary care system? And how can we integrate so that an older person, but people of all ages can actually seamlessly access services that will improve their health and well-being? Long-term care, one of the indicators is long-term care, good long-term care in every single country of the world. Thirdly, age-friendly environments, and that word has already been mentioned already, but what is it? It is this environment for all ages, but it's one that enables us to maximise our functional ability, which then will prompt us to be able to contribute to society. And finally, combating ageism. It is the insidious nature of ageism that actually prevents us from being who we are, as an older person. And that's not only self-identifying ageism, it's interpersonal ageism and it's institutional ageism. So there's the four action areas, but what can we do? We have four enablers. Next slide, please. And those four enablers, I believe, is where civil society can really inform and drive change using our voice and engagement and this very conference is about engagement. It's also about leadership and capacity building. It's sharing resources unconditionally across sectors and disciplines. It's putting your hand forward and contributing to another person or organization's agenda. 
Thirdly, connecting stakeholders. And it's not only connecting of the like, it's connecting unlike together. Bring unlike together to learn from one another with the focal point of improving the health of well-being of older people. And finally, strengthening research, data and innovation. And just on that point, I do want to make the point, the Chief Statistician for UN Women, Papa Sek, just in a webinar this week said, it's very rare that data is collected on women older than 49. This, much, this must change. Next, please. What can we do also? Not only can we be one of those enabling drivers, so leadership, voice and engagement, connecting stakeholders, and also measuring, but we can right now, right this day, we can actually join the decade. So I put the link up there. Anyone, any organization can sign up to the decade. And on that decade platform, you will also see a portal around civil society organization mapping and engagement. The IFA together with several other organizations are mapping civil society organizations so that you can be invited to a colloquium, a colloquium to share agendas and initiatives so that we can be a driving force in the decade. Next, please. So this is what we're all about. You know, join with IFA and other organisations around the world to establish a civil society alliance, not dissimilar to the NCD alliance, so that we can be one of those driving forces that supports, delivers and helps us be accountable, but also all those in the global collaboration. Next, please. I think it's fitting that we return quietly to the leadership of the UN Secretary General. Across the last two years, um, the UN Secretary General has been at the forefront of many powerful conversations around the pandemic. He has challenged us all, but he has challenged us with hope, with integrity, with humility, with compassion. And this is a statement from the UN Secretary General, you know, early in 2021. And let me repeat his words, but not so eloquently. The potential of older persons is a powerful base for sustainable development. More than ever, we must listen to their voices, suggestions and ideas to build more inclusive and age-friendly societies. I thank you for the opportunity to be with you today and to be part of this important panel with friends and colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. I add my congratulations for this wonderful ILAGA conference and bringing us all together. Next slide, please. I'm here to tell you just a little bit about uh, the fact that uh, uh, aging hasn't always been at the top of the priorities at the United Nations. And it really began in about the 1970s. Recognizing the UN was established in 1945. However, you know, the population aging was much smaller then, life expectancy was much less then. But I have to give credit to a champion for aging issues at the UN back then was Ambassador Julia T. Alvarez from the uh, Dominican Republic. And she became known fondly as the ambassador on aging. And I like to credit her with really educating UN member states and the UN system about taking note of aging. It was actually uh, in the 19, set, late 1970s when the three NGO committees on aging were established here in New York at the UN, one in Geneva, and one in Vienna. And our overall involvement of the NGO community is to provide our expertise and our perspective to the UN community. And as has already been mentioned, there was the First World Assembly on aging in 1982, uh, I mean, sorry, in um, uh, 2002, 
uh, but the um, World Assembly in 2002 adopted the uh, Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging. Um, and I would say that building from the First World Assembly in 1982 to 2002 is when a lot of that work really, really went on. And as mentioned earlier by both speakers, the MIPA, the Madrid International Plan of Action was created. And as you heard, every five years, it um, voluntary reviews are presented to, to um, member states. However, there's nothing mandatory about their following the principles identified in MIPA, which cover independence, participation, care, self-fulfillment, and dignity. Next slide, please. The NGO Committee on Aging, our tagline, Building a Society for All Ages, actually comes out of the 1999 International Year of Older Persons. Building a Society for All Ages, I think we're always in this process. But in that year, the then Secretary General Kofi Annan stated, and I quote, we live in an age to which many labels have been attached. It is the post-Cold War age, the post-industrial age, the age of the internet, the age of globalization, and he added, the day of longevity. The overall mission of our NGO Committee on Aging in New York is really to raise the awareness of opportunities and challenges, but I emphasize the opportunities of an aging society. And to advocate within the UN system to integrate aging. Now, great strides have certainly been made since the 1970s, thanks in great part to the Program on Aging Unit of DESA, which Amal Abu Rafi leads. And certainly, as you heard from Jane, the WHO in adoption of the Decade of Healthy Aging in some of its seminal reports, such as on ageism. We encourage member states to include older adults in all aspects of work and to see us as a resource, not a drain on the resources. Too often, I feel older persons are seen as just beneficiaries of service and not as rights holders. Too often, societies and members of society take a paternalistic view of older persons that we need to be cared for, not that some do not need care, but we are not seen as contributing members of society. So much advocacy work was done in prepara preparation for those sustainable development goals, which were adopted in 2015 such as inclusion of the recognition of health, which must have a life course approach, as you heard, and education and lifelong learning. And I know ALAGA is creating incredible programs addressing these two important goals, and the fifth being on gender equality of women, a gender equality of which I say recognition of older women is long overdue, because they are a age group especially um, vulnerable to lifelong inequalities. Hence, older persons recognizing older persons as valuable resources in the community for economic and social prosperity. It's very important that we call on all member states and remind them that this is an important aspect. Next slide, please. Our specific goals, for we do them in two-year cycles for the NGO Committee on Aging. But I want to take you back just a moment because it was alluded to earlier by Amal. Back in 1948, the UN adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but it did not specifically mention older persons. Since then, there have been many other adaptions, adoptions of conventions that are legal. Now, a convention is a legally binding document, such as the Convention on the Rights of the Child, 
or very recently the Convention on the, on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So it was time that older persons be really recognized within a human rights community. So since, so in 2010, member states voted to establish the Open-Ended Working Group on Aging, that's the OEWG, to really, with the purpose of strengthening the protection of the human rights of older persons. So just last week, we concluded the 12th meeting of the OEWG, and what we came to the conclusion, member states, many spoke eloquently, we have enough data, we've done enough research, we have already documented the gaps that are there, and certainly the horrific violations of human rights that have, has occurred during the COVID pandemic. If you just think about the, I know Amal doesn't like percentages, but the percentage of older persons who died during COVID versus younger age groups in comparison to their percentage of their population, it's atrocious due to lack of equal access to treatment, vaccines. So it really is an opportunity for us to raise the awareness. I'm encouraged by last week's conclusion uh, of the open-ended working group where there was a strong agreement by many, many member states to move forward with establishment of a core group that will look at the gaps and to determine what types of corrective actions will need to be taken on an intercessional basis before the, the, they reconvene next year. Our goal too is very important, is to strengthen and, our, and continue our work with global alliances for example, during the preparation of the Sustainable Development Goals, we actually established a stakeholder group on aging, which now has status within the UN as one of the major groups. So we can speak with a more unified voice, but we did it collaboratively. So we work very closely and increasingly with uh, the disability community, with the women's move, uh, group, uh, the Sustainable Development uh, Major Group, etc. It has to be collaborative. We can no longer function in silos. The other uh, important uh, global alliance for the rights of older people was established uh, to really look at aging with rights, and I commend you to their uh, website and joining to really find the tools in which to educate yourself and those around you, as well as our own NGO website, about why and how the importance of establishing uh, a, the legal, legally binding protection of human rights of older persons. Certainly we engage our membership just as we've done with uh, Sa Dr. Sally Jaco and Alaga and our participation here today is representative of that. And lastly, we use our, our programs, which are virtual periodic monthly programs, as well as the various side events that we collaborate on and fun at the UN, but also with our newsletter and social media to promote our work. Next slide, please. Just to give you a... Next slide. Yeah, there we are. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> just some things coming up in the future. Um, the UN did establish World Elder Abuse Awareness Day that observe, is observed every June 15th. And the, there are continuing data coming out uh, about the increase in, in violence, abuse, and neglect against older persons, particularly during this pandemic. Unfortunately, it's oftentimes a taboo topic, uh, one of embarrassment and shamefulness for older persons to come forward with. But we work together with UN uh, DESA and with the International Network on the Prevention of Elder Abuse to host an observance on this day. My goal is that we one day no longer need such a day because we have eradicated that. The High Level Political Forum that's the body established by the UN to monitor the progress on the SDGs. 
have to say progress has been slowed because of the pandemic, <clears throat> but we still need to keep everyone's feet to the fire to ensure that older persons are included. The overall theme of the sustainable development goals is to leave no one behind. We must make sure that occurs. So I've already mentioned the stakeholder group on aging involvement, the Global Alliance on Rights of Older Persons. Of course, the UN back in 1990 did establish the UN International Day of Older Persons held every year, October 1. Sometimes because of how it falls, it might be the day or two after, before. But anyway, um, the theme this year, and we collaborate with the NGO Committees on Aging in Vienna and Geneva with our New York program, is on older women, as well as climate change and all the uh, disasters, which of course we're seeing played out so vividly and what's happening with older people in Ukraine. So anyway, that's just to give you kind of a, a highlight of what we're working on. I invite you to, to join us uh, and each one of us can make a difference. Let's celebrate our world's longevity. Thank you.